Okay, I think we're set here this morning. Um, before I forget, let me tell you that since we're going to be gone Wednesday, I plan to do the Wednesday, the normal Wednesday time tomorrow, Tuesday morning at, at 10. And of course, you can watch it later on Wednesday if that's your normal time to watch anyway, or it'll be... It'll be recorded, so um, Facebook records it and keeps it after we live stream. So anyway, that's just this week, um, Tuesday, tomorrow morning, we'll do that broadcast that normally would be done on Wednesday. So, all right, uh, the book I wanted to show you, and in fact, we'll use it this morning as we study, continue to study 1 John 3 is this one, um, Lewis Burkhoff, Systematic Theology. Now, I've talked to you before about um, G.K. Beale's books on what we call Biblical Theology. Biblical Theology is the tracing of themes, specifically the, the grand theme of the Bible, uh, from Genesis to Revelation, and fitting it all together and, and using um, those themes to help us interpret Scripture properly. And, and so, for example, when the New Testament says that we are new creations in Christ, old things have passed away and so forth, well, immediately we start thinking about the first creation and how and what God's intent was for man in Eden and how he's restoring it. That whole, that whole kind of thinking is, uh, is an example of biblical theology. Systematic theology is what I guess you would call it topical. Topical theology. It um, uh, handles the great doctrines of the Bible by... Um, categorizing them under a, under a heading and, and uh, summarizing what the Bible teaches about a given topic. So, for example, um, if you look in the table of contents here, he begins uh, with the doctrine of God. That's where most systematic theologies then will begin uh, discussing the, the existence of God. Can God be known? Uh, the attributes of God, the names of God, and so forth, and then discusses each one of those, brings in scriptures that relate to that subject. And so it's a kind of a uh, resource that you can go to and say, well, what does the Bible teach about Christ? And you can look under, the, under that section. Now there's another aspect that, that's really helpful in a systematic theology as well, and that is that at the back, it will give an index of scripture and uh, now it's not comprehensive it's not going to comment on every single verse in the Bible like a like a, a comprehensive commentary would on say the Gospel of Matthew but uh, often you will find the passage that you're studying uh, listed in the scripture index and then you can go back and, and turn to that page and and see what it says and and so Burkhoff for example does have some comments on 1st John 3 and we'll look at those uh, more in, in a moment so anyway um, I was looking here on Amazon and uh, to try and get the the cost of this down first of all you can get it on Kindle for nothing uh, for zero and you can buy it in paperback for $20. Hardcover is $45. Uh, that, that's new. I'm sure there's all kinds of used copies out there that, that you can get as well. Now, Burkhoff wrote some other... I should tell you a little bit who he was here. It says on the, on the flap here. Uh, Professor Burkhoff died in 1957 at the age of 83. He was an outstanding American teacher and the author of some 22 books. After two pastorates, 
He began his long career as professor at Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids in 1906, and he remained there for 38 years, devoting his talents and immense stores of knowledge to the training of men for the ministry. His systematic theology, that's this book, was his great work, his magnum opus, being revised and enlarged during his lifetime until it reached its present final form. Now, um, I see here on Amazon, too, as you thumb down, that uh, scroll down, that he, he wrote uh, some other really helpful books, too. Here's a summary of Christian doctrine. That must be kind of a, a condensation of his systematic theology. Here's one on, now this is interesting, the history of Christian doctrines. And now here, here there would be discussion about various early heresies and so forth that uh, have threatened the, the, the church. And so the history of Christian doctrines. Ha, this one, this guy, I don't know how this happens on, on uh, Amazon. You can, you can buy that one apparently for $971. So I, I've, I've seen that happen with some of my books before, too. I, I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, um, he's got his... Uh, there's a, a Spanish translation of his uh, systematic theology. So that would be extremely useful if you're working with Spanish-speaking people. Principles of Biblical Interpretation. How to Study Your Bible, in other words. Uh, History of Christian Doctrine on Kindle for only five dollars. Uh, there's the summary again. Um, I don't know what's up with all these high price. These guys must think they have some kind of a first edition or something. One hundred twenty-five dollars. So obviously disregard that. Uh, but where was this other one here? Ah, uh, here we go. This one's fifty dollars, but it says that it's there's that it's his systematic theology revised, and I'm not sure how it was revised. This is just like 2019, um, but it says now in larger print. So maybe that was one of the things that they they did and put a new cover on it and so forth, but. At any rate, so Burkhoff, Louis Burkhoff, systematic theology, and there's, there's other. He's not the obviously the only one that wrote a systematic theology. You got Charles Hodge from the old Princeton days. Uh, that's a three volume set, and uh, and and many others as as well. Um, so, but this is a this is a reformed theology, uh, systematic theology, and and. Uh, all right, then um, let's pray. Let me get this over here to Scripture and Esau. Let's pray, and then we'll get into First John. Father, we ask your blessing on our study today of your word. We pray that you would give us insight into it and uh, that you would help us understand and appreciate more what you've done for us in Christ. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, uh, what I wanted to focus on here to, today, probably we'll spend most of our time this morning on it, is that um, uh, our, our friend Joanne back in the Midwest uh, texted me a, a good question the other day, and she asked, you know, why is it that the ESV and other versions and so forth seem to... Um, add words w and, and uh, when maybe they weren't there in the original and so forth and when the translations why they read and specifically it's this matter of of uh, John's teaching that a, a Christian a genuine Christian will um, will it says things like they will not sin and then the ESV will word it they don't practice sin uh, and uh, so sometimes on s some of the reading and some of the English translations, the, uh, you can get the idea that is a John saying that a Christian never sins, a Christian never sins, uh, kind of a perfectionistic doctrine. Or if that's not what he says, then 
uh, how do the translators feel justified in uh, maybe adding a phrase or something to make it mean um, a Christian does not walk in sin, doesn't habitually live in sin, and that sort of a thing. So those are, those are good questions, and that's the thing that I wanted us to look at a little more closely than uh, today. And uh, so thanks to Joanne for her, her question there. You remember, now this is this kind of a thing, we've read it numbers of times already. For example, the last verse in chapter 2 says this, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Okay, so if you've been born again, then you practice righteousness. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more close. That's kind of one of the examples, but there's others here as well as we get into chapter 3. Now, we might have to come down a little ways here. Oh, here we go. See this, 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. So you see this, this phrase, it, you know, did John say literally everyone who sins practices lawlessness and in other words belongs to the, to the Antichrist and, and so forth? Or did the translators add this phrase, makes a practice of sinning? And so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, verse 6 again, no one who abides in him, you see this, keeps on sinning. Or did John say no one who abides in him sins? Or did he say no one who abides in him keeps on sinning? Or did the translators ask, uh, add words there? Uh, no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or know him. Uh, verse 7, whoever practices righteousness. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the, from the beginning. Oh, uh, verse 9, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. And uh, Okay, so um, over and over and over again, John makes this uh, these assertions, uh, these propositions, and says that this is how it is. A Christian does not keep on sinning. A Christian does not practice sin. A, a Christian practices righteousness. Okay. Well, let me show you how the, the translators, uh, why the translators worded it in that manner. Um, and maybe this will help you un understand uh, this a little bit more. First of all, of course, keep in mind that whenever you're translating uh, from another language, in, in this case into English, it, it doesn't matter if it's Greek or Hebrew or German or Spanish. If you've studied a foreign language, then you know that this is the case, that it is impossible to translate literally. Okay, if, if, you, if you take a... Uh, a foreign language, a statement in a foreign language, and you translate it word for word, literally, um, that way, you're going to end up with something that doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. So, translating requires um, considering idioms, figures of speech, the syntax of the, of the language, and so forth. Uh, otherwise, you'll, you'll end up with something that's just a uh, a hodgepodge that, that makes no sense at all. I was I should have brought a I should have brought what's called a Greek interlinear. I think it, I think it's at my office at the church. I don't have it here, but a Greek interlinear is a Greek New Testament that that has the literal words between the Greek lines and I put it in English right under it. And so there's an example of a word-for-word -word translation that's just designed to help the reader um, understand which Greek word corresponds to a, a, 
which English word in the Bible translation. But if you take an interlinear, for example, and you just start reading the uh, English uh, word for word in, in between the lines, you, you would see what I mean. It makes, it makes no sense at all. Well, um, so let me give you a little bit of a Greek lesson here and uh, see if I can get this right here. Okay, so um, this is that compare feature of your versions on, on eSword. Let me come down to one of the, uh, oh here, you gotta, you gotta go verse by verse this way on this. Uh, okay, here we are. So here's verse four. Here's the ESV. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So we want to look at this makes a practice of sinning phrase. Uh, let's see, we also have the King James here. Whosoever committeth sin. See, now this is what I mean. In the in the uh, King James Version, and this is a correct, this is a correct translation. Um, we'd say commits, right? Whosoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So this would be more like if you're reading the King James and you look at this, whosoever commits sin, okay? Whoa, that's a little bit more like. Well, John, are you saying that if I commit a sin, then I am of the Antichrist, you know? I'm, I'm of the, the man of lawlessness, right? Is that what you're saying? And yet you see that also the NASB, New American Standard, which is, which is a more, we would say, literal translation than the ESV. It doesn't mean it's a better translation, but it's a more, the words more literally correspond to um, the Greek words. But even here, in the New American Standard, then, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. So, so the question is, where did the practice come from? Well, it comes from a couple of different uh, spots, but specifically, what you've got here, now I, I know you don't... Uh, yeah, most of you haven't studied Greek or anything, but it's not necessary for what I what I want to show you. Um, what I wanted to show you is here is the Greek New Testament, and here's that verse, and this this word right over here, this one, this is the word for sin. Okay, this is the word for sin. That little backwards apostrophe on the top of the A, that's an alpha, an A. That little backwards apostrophe means, is it called a rough breathing? It's an H, okay? And so you say this, ha, hamartion, hamartion. So like in a systematic theology, the doctrine of sin is under the heading of hamartiology, okay? So hamartion. So there's the word for sin. It's a noun. And, uh, but back here is the verb, okay? So, and, and what this, what this is, this is this, see, here's another backwards apostrophe above the O, above the Omicron. So you say, ha, or something like that anyway. But this, this one over here, this first little word, pas, that, that's all or every, okay? So the idea of everyone but this word right here, poion, poion, see there's a pi, the P sound, poion, omega, long O. Uh, the, uh, you look at the endings of verbs in Greek to determine what tense they're in, okay? So that, there's a lot of memorization, which I'm pretty rusty on right now, but, uh, but at any rate, but you can, you can look these up, and uh, this is a verb. Actually, it's a participle, but for now, we'll just call it a verb. And uh, uh, this ending right here, this O, and this is the new O-N ending here, tells you that, it, if you've studied Greek, it tells you that this, this is a verb in the present tense, okay? And it comes from a verb 
poieo, which means to do, to do or to make, to do or to make, okay? So, and the way that you translate this then is, remember this is all or all, all, everyone, who does, who does, everyone who is doing sin. Also, there's the also, also, see here's another form of poi, poieo, to do, a little different ending here. Uh, also does lawlessness, there's the word for lawlessness. So um, here's the point though. Both uses of poieo, the verb to do, both of these, even though they're in a bit different form, they are both in the present tense. And as you go down through uh, John here in, in chapter 3, for example, as you go down through, what you find is all of these statements that say, if you're a Christian, you do righteousness. Okay, if you're, a, if you're not a Christian, the, you, you, you do unrighteousness. All of those verbs are in the Greek present tense. Now, why is that important? Well, here's the deal with Greek verbs. Um, Greek verbs um, have uh, more information in them than, a, in, than an English verb in, in a lot of cases, okay? That's a, a more precise language in a lot of ways than English is. But when you, when you have a verb that's in the present tense, it, um, well, not just the present tense, but a Greek verb has not only the time of action in it, the time, you know, was it in the past time, present time, future time, like we have in English, but it also, the Greek tense of a, of a Greek verb, the tense, also says something about the type of action, the type of action. So, so for instance, when I studied Greek in Greek class, they always remember, you know, the Greek verb has uh, time and type, time and type of action. In the present tense, the type, what kind of action is the present tense? Well, um, it is, at least in, in these verbs here that John is using, um, it, ha it carries the idea, the type of action is continuing action. Continuing action. All right? So, so that's why the translators are at, adding phrases that, make it, that reflect the present tense Greek verb. Everyone who... See, if they just said, everyone who does sin, Everyone who does sin. That, that's kind of like what the King James has, right? Whosoever co commits sin. Well, if they just said that and translated that into English, guess what? That doesn't give us as much information as the Greek verb actually has. That Greek verb in the present tense actually carries this, the translation. This is an accurate translation. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning. Because the type of action in that present tense verb is a continuing one. It is a habitual one. And John is careful to use that. Uh, down through, let me, let me go down through some other verses here. Oh, wait a minute, maybe there was one there. No, that's okay. Okay, yeah, here we go. Verse 6. No one who abides in him, and the ESV has, keeps on sinning. Keeps on sinning. Okay? Why is that? Well, look at the Greek again here. Everyone, there's the, the all, pause. Everyone uh, who, <laughs> here again, you can't translate it literally. Everyone, this is the in him. En auto. That's the in him. Okay, everyone who abides, here's the abide word, and it's present tense. Now think about this, a Christian 
is a person who is in Christ, right? We're in Christ. We're joined to Christ. And, and so a Christian is a person who is who abides in Christ. Well, you don't, unless your theology is all messed up, you don't come and go from Christ. You're not abiding in him and then you're not abiding in him. You're not joined to him and then you're not joined to him, this kind of a thing. And so clearly what this means is here, this is, this is, this is accurate, uh, no one who abides in him, and in fact, you know, they, they, could have, they could have even added some more words here to show that this is also a present tense. But anyway, um, notice up here they have keeps on sinning. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Well, if you look at that, keeps on sinning in, in, the, in Greek, you actually don't have literal words there that for keeps on. What you do have is a this ook that just means not. It's like putting no or not in front of a word, okay? Uh, and then here's the verb, hamartane. That ending there tells you that it's in a pres it's a present tense once again. So it contains, in that word, in itself, in that Greek verb, <clears throat> is contained not <coughs> only a time, but a type of action. Keeping on sinning. Doing sin habitually, okay? And that, that's where that idea is. So in, in, order to, in order to translate that into English accurately and convey the idea that it is a continuing action, the, the English translators will do things like add words, keeps on sinning, okay? Keeps on sinning. So I hope that that, I hope that helps you uh, understand this as to, to why those words um, are, are put in there. They, they're, it's like, it's not like the Greek verb itself contains those ideas and to the Greek reader they, they see that just in that verb oh you know there oh, I understand that but habitual action but um, a, an English reader wouldn't if you just translate that literally and, and in a sense to not put those words in there would be not to to not accurately, Translate it, certainly not fully translate it. Um, I wonder how, I'm just going to look at the King James here. Let me go back up to 6. So the ESV is, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. What do we got down here? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Okay, you see that? Whosoever sins has not seen him, neither known him. So the King James there can, uh, you, you look at that, and then you look at the ESV, and you say, well, this one has more words in it than the King James. Yeah, it has more words in it, and frankly, in this case, because it's a better translation. Um, now, there's another way, of course, and a very important way that we know what a uh, scripture is supposed to mean, and that is by the context, right? The whole broad context of the whole Bible, what the Bible teaches about, what the whole Bible teaches about a particular subject, and then maybe the immediate context in the chapter or book that you're reading in. And so you look at, if you look at the King James here, this is not a wrong translation by, by any means, but if you look at this, whosoever, whoever abides in him doesn't sin, okay? Doesn't sin. Well, even reading that in the King James, and you, you relate that to the context of the Bible. Does the Bible, or even 1 John itself, teach that a Christian will never sin, never sin. And, and the answer is no, if you, if you think about it. 
you go back up to uh, chapter 1, and there, um, you remember we read about uh, if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and, uh, and, and, and confessing our sin and so forth. So, so it can't be, John doesn't teach that, um, that a Christian is absolutely sinless, and, and if you sin even once, then you're not, you're not a Christian. So uh, you would use the context then to interpret what, what the King James means here. Whoever abides in him does not sin. And you know, oh, it must mean doesn't habitually walk in and sin. So, but these, these other translations help us, right? No one, oh, look at here. The New American Standard is more literal, uh, literal, word for word, like the uh, King James. No one who abides in him sins. Boom, right? There it is. No one who sins has seen him or known him. Well, you know, you, gotta, you about have to say that the ESV is a better translation there. And it's an accurate translation. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Because that keeping on sinning, that's the type of action, continual action, that's contained in that, in that, Greek, in that Greek verb. So... As much as I like, I like the New American Standard for Bible study because it is more word for word. But nevertheless, you see that at least in this case, um, uh, the ESV does a, a better a better rendering, and you can have uh, full confidence in this translation. Keeps on sinning, okay, because of what we know about the the Greek verb. Now this this is the point that, um, let's see, was it here? Or maybe I need to get down a little bit further here. Um, no, I can, do, I can do it here. I told you that in a systematic theology like Burkhoff's here, that you can look in the back, there's a scripture index, and sometimes you will find the verse or passage that you are studying listed back there, and then it, it'll give you the page number where that verse is mentioned in the systematic theology. And there's actually a surprising number. This is a pretty comprehensive uh, index, scripture index in the back he refers to. There, there's quite a few on First John. So anyway, I, I looked back there, and this is what John, this is what he, his comment, this is Burkhoff's comment here, on these kinds of verses in 1 John that we've just been talking about. He says, The Apostle John declares explicitly that they who are born of God do not sin. Okay? But when John says that they who are born of God do not sin, he is contrasting the two states of the Christian, represented by the old and the new man, at I, I would have used the term there, the new man and the flesh, okay, the spirit and the flesh. But uh, one, of the, one of the essential characteristics of the new man is that he does not sin. In view of the fact that John invariably uses the present tense, the Greek present tense, to express the idea that the one born of God does not sin, it's possible that he desires to express the idea that the child of God does not go on sinning habitually as the devil does. Okay, so he's he's saying things like that, that I've just been that I've just been telling you here, and uh, uh, let's look at this verse eight as uh, he he just mentioned it here. Let me go back to um, well, I can just kind of leave it in the compare mode. Look at look at verse eight. We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but. Verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning, see down here in the Greek, there's that to do verb, present tense, the one who does, present tense, the one who keeps on doing sin, okay, um, is of the devil. Now look what it says about the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. 
Okay, the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Let's take a look at the Greek down here. <clears throat> for, here's the from, for from the beginning. Okay, our case, from the beginning. Yeah, you can recognize this. It kind of looks like diabolo, right? Is it, that's what the word is, diabolos. That's a name for Satan, for the devil in here, okay? Diabolon, okay? For from the beginning, the devil... Now look at this. Check this out. The verb here for sinning, hamartane, is in exactly the same form that we've been looking at in this chapter uh, several times, it appears, or when it's talking about, you know, the one who is born of God does not sin, present tense, keep on sinning. or uh, And so, well, this is in the present tense. Right here, it's in the same form when it's talking about the devil. For from the beginning, the devil sins, okay? Now, does that mean he just sinned at some point. Well, this is a devil we're talking about. And John's emphasis is from the beginning. He walks in sin, okay? Uh, so, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. It's characteristic of him. And, and so that same phrase, that same verb, is what's used of people who are hypocrites, who don't know Christ, who are children of the devil, and um, uh, and and so obviously in the devil's case, how do we interpret that verb? Well, it keeps on sinning, habitually sinning. It's characteristic of him, and that's what John then is meaning about all the people that are his children, the children then of the of the devil. Um, so all right, well, that, and that's why Burkhoff mentioned that here, right? John invariably uses the present tense to express the idea that, that the one born of God, the genuine Christian, does not sin. It's possible he desires to express the idea that the child of God does not go on sinning habitually as the devil does. Okay, right? Um, he certainly, John certainly does not mean to assert that the believer never commits an act of sin. And then he refers us back to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, where it says, we, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and so on. And then he, he comments here on what's called the perfectionist theology. What is the perfectionist theology? That's the teaching, you know, uh, John Wesley held to that, um, is that a Christian is to arrive in, in this present life at a state of sanctification where you're sinless, you don't sin anymore, all right? It's an error, it's wrong, uh, but uh, uh, Burkhoff says, the perfectionist, the person that teaches perfectionism, cannot very well use these passages to prove his point. See, so you, you get a perfectionist, they'll look at this and use the King James, you know, hey, if you commit, a, commit sin, you're of the devil, all right? If you ever commit a sin, you're not a believer. That kind of a thing. Um, the, but the perfectionists cannot very well use these passages to prove their point, since they would prove too much for the, for the perfectionist's purpose. He does not make bold to say that all believers, John doesn't, are actually sinless. Uh, oh, well, I guess he's talking about the perfectionists here. The perfectionist says that um, doesn't say that all Christians are actually sinless, but only that they can reach a state of sinless perfection. But John says, um, if you took this interpretation that John means no Christian sins, then you would have to say, well, John teaches that this is true of all Christians, that no true Christian sins anymore. Well, that can't, that doesn't, fly with what the perfectionist teaches. So, but anyway, our point is then that, as Burkhoff says, that what John is doing is teaching us that 
a genuine Christian doesn't keep on doing sin, does not habitually walk in sin, and, uh, and so forth. Now, uh, okay, let's go back to the ESV here. And um, let me just read, starting at verse 5, and then I want to comment on another verse down at the bottom here. Uh, you know that he, that is Christ, appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Um, let's see here. I wanted to show you, um, well, I'll do this one step at a time. We, I might have to wait until next time, but um, let's look at verse 9 here, okay? No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. Now, you might have noticed that Burkhoff said, When John says that they who are born of God do not sin, he is contrasting the two states of the Christian, represented by the old and the new man, as to their essential nature and principle. Now, now part of this, I'll just, I'm just kind of suggesting to you, to think about, and it's worth thinking about, um, but the Christian, we know this, the Christian has been born again. We are new creations in Christ. The old man that we were is dead and buried and gone. We still live, however, in these corrupting fleshly bodies and uh, and so the bible talks about the flesh and and it uses it uh, it uses that word for more than just this physical skin and bones and so forth that we have the the flesh is almost like a an entity in itself but for example in galatians 5 we have the the teaching that the um Spirit in the Christian. This is how it is in the Christian. The, the Holy Spirit in us is always opposed to our flesh. And we are to walk in the Spirit and um, be characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on. In contrast to that, you have the deeds of the flesh. Jealousy, enmity, strife, and and so forth. Well, um, and so you have this battle within within the Christian. Um, how does that relate to verse nine? Well, see this phrase here: "For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he's been born of God." Well, now think about this: if you're a Christian, you've been born of God. You're born again. New birth. How did this happen? Well, John's using some kind of human uh, illustrations here, phraseology. You know, how, how were we born in the first place? Well, we were born of a seed of our father, a sinful uh, man, and, uh, and then we reflect 
our earthly father's character, certainly in that we are sinner, we are born into this world as sinners too. Well, so John's using that imagery for us here in verse 9 that tells us we've been born of God, his seed abides in us. Now, this is fairly profound, and I don't pretend to understand it completely, but, but think about this. When we are born again, when God uh, creates us as new creations, and the old man is, is put to death and buried with Christ, then what John is calling God's seed, and what maybe Paul is calling the, the Spirit, although he's certainly referring to the, to the Holy Spirit that's in every Christian, but the new man, okay? That's what we're talking about here. The new creation. The new you. When you were born again. Who you are now in Christ. That there is, there seems to be some teaching here of the idea that that new person cannot sin. Literally. Cannot sin. And that can, that can be some of also what John is getting at here. You know, we want we see this that these statements like this. He cannot sin. I don't know how the let's see, let's look at that in the King James here. Uh, there we go. King James. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. His God's seed remains in him. He cannot sin. Because he's born of God. Even the New American Standard is, is, is like that. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. You can bet that these are going to be, um, yeah, these are present tense verbs here. All, all, of, the, all of these are. So, um, now you think about this. So God, by his Spirit, creates us as new creations, as his children. We're called his children. He effects it by it's his seed has been given to us so that we are and we reflect his character. And, and I, I think that John is, is telling us here that that new creation, the new creation that you are in Christ, can't sin. Can't sin. And, and you see that if you go over and read Galatians 5 uh, about that, you know, starting at verse 16, about that war between the flesh and the spirit, you, that seems to support this idea that, that that part of you that's been born of God cannot sin. And if you think about it, if you think about it, if I mean, what did God create when you were born again? What did He create? Did He create a sinner? Did He create a He created a new creation? Now, um, and you can think about it this way: if a genuine Christian were to die today, we know that. He or she would be immediately with the Lord, okay? And what will they be like when they're immediately with the Lord? Well, one of the things that they will be like, certainly is true of them, they're sinless, right? Well, when did that happen? Did that happen, they were, you know, they, as a new creation, they were sinners before, but now that they died, now they're not, or whatever. And I think that what you would say is, well, they were created and sinless when they were born again, but part of us still is that flesh that remains. And we can't say, we can't get rid of it by just saying, oh, well, that's, you know, that's not us at all. I'm not responsible for what the flesh does. That sounds like what some of this Gnostic teaching that was going on in John's day was. So, uh, so we still battle with it, but the moment that we are out of this world, we die and we're with the Lord, 
we're free of that. We're free of all that flesh and all of that sin and free to be fully who we really are. So those are just some things to think about. And, and I think that those are, and particularly here in verse 9, when John says, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he can't sin. God's seed, that which is creating, can't sin because he's been born of God. And of course, what's the whole emphasis here? The emphasis is, the idea is that this is how you can know whether you really, you know, are, is there in you now, are you a person who does not want to sin, who wants to obey the Lord, who rejects the temptation that when it, uh, to sin when it comes our way. And when we do sin, when we do give in to the flesh, that we repent of it and we, and we grieve over it. Are you that kind of a person? Or are you a person who says they're a Christian, but in fact, you're living just like you always did with some hypocrisy thrown in and you're walking in sin, you're practicing sin, and it really doesn't, it doesn't bo bother you then, you see. That's what John is, uh, is getting to. And finally, I'll try to, I'll make a note to give you this illustration that I found this last week online uh, in a church's doctrinal statement. Um, we'll look at verse 10 a little bit more closely and check this out. You know how we're all the time told that we're not to judge and you know, if a person says they're a Christian, well, we, how, how dare you ever doubt that? They're the ones that know. And John flat out says right here, look, it's evident, it's plain who are the children of God and who are the children of, de of the devil. So that tells me that we can, we can know. He's going to go on in chapter 4, verse 1, and tell us, hey, test the spirits. There's lots of false teachers out there, you know. Test the spirit." Well, how are you going to test them if without some, some critical judgment? And, and, and John points of very practical ways here is that, look, you've got children of God, you've got children of the devil. Here's how you can tell the two apart. So we'll stop right there and we'll pick up with this um, tomorrow morning. So it'll be, you can either watch it tomorrow morning at 10 or at or you or actually, I might record a little bit earlier. Or you can uh, watch it uh, Wednesday at the usual time. It'll be recorded on Facebook. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for what you've done for us and to us in Christ, making us new creations. And we pray, Father, that increasingly um, the the new us would grow stronger and stronger and put to death the deeds of the flesh by your Spirit. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.